My name is Professor Nazar al Naqshbandi from King Saud University. I have the great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Asif Saifuddin. He's a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist, author, and a researcher whose studies are published in national and international scientific journals. He will talk to us uh, about three topics consecutively. The topics are the role of plain x rays in diagnosis of soft tissue tumors, and the second topic will be imaging of musculoskeletal infection. And the third topic will be imaging of the lumbosacral spine degenerative disease and this thesis. So, Dr. Asa. Uh, Assalamu everybody, and uh, thank you, Nizar, for the introduction. Now, we saw in our first lecture uh, some of the most advanced uh, imaging techniques, looking at tractography and, and so on in the brain and cervical spine. But we're going to come back to something very basic now and just look at the uh, role of the plane radiograph, if it actually has one, in the assessment of soft tissue masses. So by uh, introduction, we just uh, realized that radiography can demonstrate limited things uh, on plane films in terms of soft tissues. We can see tissues containing calcium, so we see bone, we see calcification or ossification, uh, maybe within bone trabeculae that may be visible in soft tissue masses, within muscle, tendon, ligaments, and fat. We can also identify fat, and occasionally we can see uh, gas within soft tissue lesions. So, for example, uh, the first thing we must be clear about is that uh, radiography cannot differentiate uh, lesions containing fluid and lesions containing uh, uh, simply soft tissue. So here we have two examples, particularly around joints, where we can see here, can't get the, uh, here we go. We can see here a soft tissue mass on the medial side of the knee, on this case, and here a large soft tissue mass in the anterocubital fossa. Um, I'm afraid we'll just have to continue uh, using this screen. So if we look at these two cases, we have a soft tissue or a, a mass adjacent to the medial side of the knee and also one in the anterocubital fossa. And based purely on the plane radiographs, we cannot differentiate whether these are uh, fluid-containing lesions or soft tissue-containing lesions. And this requires either ultrasound or MRI, possibly with contrast, to make this differentiation. So again, if we look at the corresponding MR studies, the coronal T2-weighted image here shows a large cyst uh, adjacent to the medial femoral condyle uh, and connecting to a complex tear in the posterior third of the medial meniscus. So this is an example of a large meniscal cyst. Whereas in this case here, this large mass in the anterocubital fossa in this elderly patient turned out to be a large area of synovitis and ganglion formation related to rheumatoid disease in the elbow joint. Now, the talk is mainly based on this paper which we published uh, in Skeletal Radiology back in 2009, where we um, looked at a large consecutive series of patients presenting to our centre uh, over an eight-year period, 1,058 cases. Um, these were referrals to a specialist oncology unit, so they do therefore result in some selection bias. And of these cases, 454 patients had radiographs uh, of the presenting lesion. So we're going to look through the different kind of things we can find on a plain film in a patient presenting with a soft tissue mass. Now, there was a plain film abnormality demonstrated in 62% of cases. The commonest was the demonstration itself of a soft tissue mass. Uh, in 7% of the cases, we saw fat. In 17%, some kind of calcification or ossification. We differentiate them by calling ossification when we can see trabecular bone formation within the lesion. Uh, involvement of the bone was seen in 14% of cases, and very occasionally we saw uh, either a radiopaque foreign body or some gas within the lesion. So the majority of patients, uh, about two-thirds, would have some kind of abnormality on their plain film when presenting with a soft tissue tumor. Of the 31% with a soft tissue mass, 64% um, uh, ended up having a sarcoma or lymphoma. So, the finding of a soft tissue mass, the, the fact that you can see a soft tissue mass within muscle on the plain film, uh, 
is very suggestive that we may be dealing with a malignant lesion. The implication being that the tumor is quite large because it cannot be differentiated in terms of contrast from the, from the muscle. So to, to produce a soft tissue mass visible on plain film, it should be relatively large, which therefore indicates that it's more likely to be malignant. In about a quarter of the cases, the lesions were benign neoplastic lesions, and in 11%, they were non-neoplastic lesions. And the differentiation of whether a lesion is likely to be benign or malignant also is related to its location. So certainly in the fingers or toes, if we see a soft tissue tumor in the fingers or toes, it's most likely benign, and as we'll see, that's most commonly a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Whereas if it's in one of the major limbs, the arm, the thigh, or the calf, the lesion is most likely to be malignant. So this is an example of a, of a soft tissue mass on the volar aspect of the index finger, adjacent to the middle phalanx. Uh, and these are almost always um, lesions of giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Rarely lesions we saw were soft tissue chondroma, which may show chondral type calcification, occasionally fibroma of tendon sheath. But also remember that, uh, as I've mentioned, cystic lesions cannot be differentiated from solid lesions. So certainly those lesions related to the tendons may in fact be small ganglion cysts, and that can be assessed further with ultrasound or MRI, as I've already mentioned. But in this situation here, where we have a large soft tissue mass on the medial aspect of the distal femur within the thigh, uh, because it's uh, visible, because it's in a major uh, limb, it's very, very likely to be a sarcoma. So uh, here we see the case, uh, a large mass in the anteromedial aspect of the thigh, and on the uh, T2-weighted fat suprasaxial images, we see a very large lesion between the quadri quadriceps tendon uh, and the femur, and this uh, turned out to be, at biopsy, uh, primary soft tissue Ewing sarcoma. So there's very little, really, to be, say, say purely about soft tissue masses. The thing to remember, maybe, that if you see the mass on plain film, that you're likely dealing with, uh, with a sarcoma. 7% of the patients uh, demonstrated fat within their lesion. Of these, 50% were benign neoplastic, either lipomas, hibernoma, hemangioma, or in the small child, uh, lipoblastoma. And again, about half of the cases were malignant, mostly well-differentiated or low-grade liposarcomas, which now pathologically we refer to as atypical lipomatous tumors. Uh, in 3%, uh, which is really only one case, uh, it was a non-neoplastic lesion, which uh, an area of lymphedema in the soft tissues was uh, demonstrated some fat within it. So this is the typical kind of thing we see, uh, AP radiograph of the shoulder. We can see the shoulder joint is normal. But deep to the deltoid, we see this large fatty mass. Uh, we can identify it because its radiographic density is between that of uh, uh, bone, air, and um, Therefore, this is clearly a lesion containing a large amount of fat. If it's clean with no septa or no other uh, soft tissue structures within it, it's very likely to just represent a simple lipoma. But we assess this further with MRI. This is another example of a fatty tumor uh, arising in the groin or hip region. This is a lateral radiograph of the hip. You can see the tumor here, uh, not completely fatty. Uh, and the MR correlation is here, the axial T1 and STIR sequences showing a tumor which has the same signal characteristics as subcutaneous fat and contains some thin uh, fibrovascular septa. Now, fat may contain septa, and sometimes we can see this if they're thick enough on the plain radiograph. So this is another fatty tumor in the anterior aspect of the thigh, overlying the quadriceps musculature, and you identify thin septa within it on both the plain film and on the corresponding axial T1-weighted MRI. And when you have more septation uh, within the lesion, it's more likely that we're dealing with an atypical lipomatous tumor rather than a simple lipoma. Sometimes we see ossification within fatty tumors. You can see the, the, the fatty lesion here in the anterior aspect of the thigh uh, on the plain radiograph. And we see also an area of ossification within the tumor. This corresponds to the area of reduced uh, signal intensity on the coronal T1-weighted image. And the ossification may likely be due to fat necrosis most commonly, but rarely ossification, if it's very poorly defined, may indicate dedifferentiation to osteosarcoma. So it's an important uh, uh, thing to remember that uh, simple lipomatous tumors can dedifferentiate, and sometimes if they ossify, very rarely this could represent the development of osteosarcoma within uh, a liposarcoma. As far as calcification is concerned, it's not uncommon. We see it in about one-fifth of the cases. Uh, it's more likely, as you can see here, 
but in about 76% when you add the benign non-neoplastic and the non-neoplastic cases together. But if you see calcification within the soft tissue mass, in about three quarters of the cases, uh, it's indicative of a non-malignant lesion. Uh, the different types of calcification I'll go into in a second, uh, but calcification can occur in sarcomas, most commonly synovial sarcoma, but occasionally also we see extraskeletal chondrosarcoma and primary uh, soft tissue osteosarcoma, which can also calcify and ossify. The different types of calcification that we can identify on plain forms are listed here. So we can see phleboliths, which we all know the characteristic radiographic features of phleboliths. These indicate uh, the presence of a hemangioma. This was seen in about a quarter of the cases. Chondral type calcification, which is exactly the same radiographically as the calcification you see within bone in low grade chondral tumors, can also be seen, and this indicates usually an extraskeletal, extraskeletal chondrosarcoma or occasionally uh, a simple chondroma. Then ossification, um, when you may start seeing bone trabeculation within the soft tissue mass, again seen in about a third of cases, and all of these cases tend to be myositis or cervicans in its mature stage. Whereas if you see very non-specific, poorly defined mineralization with a tumor, that can be concerning uh, and suggestive of uh, a high-grade sarcoma, most commonly a synovial sarcoma. Um, we've mentioned phleboliths. As far as chondral type calcification is concerned, um, it's important to look at its location. It may be purely within the soft tissues, within muscle, but if it's periarticular, then the differential diagnosis changes, and we're usually talking about synovial chondromatosis when we see calcification adjacent to a joint. Ossification can also be of different types. It may be very immature, it may be well-formed and mature, and it can occur within muscles or tendons. So here we see the classical examples of phleboliths, just like we see them very commonly on pelvic radiographs. They're well-defined, rounded structures, sometimes with a slightly radiolucent centre. Uh, and we have two cases here. Uh, on your right-hand side, lateral radiograph of the posterior aspect of the ankle, demonstrating very extensive phleboliths here, and also extending out here into Kager's fat pad and indicating the presence of a fairly extensive slow-flow vascular malf mal malformation. And here on the lateral aspect of the distal calf, adjacent to the fibula, we see another example of soft tissue mass containing phleblith, this time associated with uh, some thickening of the adjacent um, fibular cortex. So phleblith, very clear in their appearance and indicative of a slow flow vascular malformation. Again, the MR correlation is important. Another case showing phleblith adjacent to the medial aspect of the elbow joint, just here. And this is the coronal T1 weighted image. So we see the lobular hemangioma here between the muscle fibers with these small phleboliths manifest by the presence of punctate or areas of signal void. And this is the sagittal uh, T2 weighted gradient echo image, again highlighting the phleboliths as areas of signal void within the lobular soft tissue mass. As I mentioned, uh, chondral type calcifications adjacent to uh, a joint, we should be thinking in terms of synovial chondromatosis. It may be associated with joint destruction, as it is in this case in the, in the finger, and also erosion of the bone. And this is the classical pattern of chondral calcification, punctate, curvy linear, uh, areas of calcification within soft tissues. And another slightly more subtle example here in the popliteal fossa, uh, in this lateral radiograph of the knee, indicative of a very extensive area of synovial chondromatosis when we look at the MR study invading the posterior recess of the knee joint and extending uh, onto the medial side here. So again, a point to then calcification adjacent to joints, then think about synovial chondromatosis. Chondral type calcification, as I've mentioned, is indicative of a soft tissue chondral tumor. So when uh, in the soft tissues, it's rare but we think about soft tissue chondroma, chondroid lipoma, or most commonly, uh, an extraskeletal chondrosarcoma. Uh, and again, we see an example here. It's a slow-growing lesion, which has caused a lot of pressure erosion of the metatarsals. And we see the classical chondral-type calcifications within this soft tissue mass. And this is the coronal stir sequence, or axial stir sequence, demonstrating the hyperintensity and lobular nature of the chondral tumor and the punctate areas of signal void representing the calcifications. But as I've mentioned, when we see uh, very immature, um, you know, extensive or not so extensive calcifications within a mass, you can see this in the calf here, a hugely swollen calf with extensive areas of mineralization, then we have to worry about sarcoma, 
uh, the sagittal T1 weighted image extent, you know, shows the extent of the lesion here within the posterior compartment with areas of hemorrhage. Calcification is seen again as areas of low signal on all pulse sequences and particularly well demonstrated on the CT study. And this was a very late presentation of a, slow, uh, of a synovial sarcoma in this particular patient. Now, ossification is again indicative of a bone forming lesion and the vast majority of cases showing ossification as opposed to simple calcification uh, will be benign, um, non-neoplastic and uh, cases of myositis or suffocans. The important thing to remember um, is that the MR study in myositis can be very um, alarming because it can show a very poorly defined lesion with extensive areas of, um, extensive areas of uh, muscle edema. But when you see this rim of low signal here within the lesion and a heterogeneous internal content, and again, we can just about see this rim of low signal on the coronal T1-weighted image, this is a very uh, clear indicator of the peripheral ossification that occurs with myositis suffocans. And what we do with these, we do not biopsy them at this stage, but we will uh, refer the patient for a CT study to show the more classical appearances of this peripheral ossification. This is a case where the patient has been um, imaged uh, on CT several weeks after the MR findings, and so the lesion has matured quite significantly compared to the appearances on the MRI. Another example of myositis suffocans is just showing how difficult it can be to make the diagnosis on MRI. So don't rely on MRI to make the diagnosis. <coughs> this is a fairly well-formed area of bone formation uh, adjacent to the posterolateral femoral cortex in the diaphyseal region. And again, the, uh, the classical appearances of mainly peripheral ossification is demonstrated very nicely on the CT study. So remember that myositis suffocans uh, if you see a mineralizing lesion on, uh, in, in the soft tissues with fairly aggressive appearances and marked muscle edema or MR, uh, always resort to CT for diagnosis and try and avoid biopsying these cases because they can be misleading on histology and suggest the presence of a high-grade uh, osteosarcoma. Another lesion which uh, can ossify is this condition usually occurring in the hands and feet, bizarre parosteal osteochondromatous proliferation, BPOP, which we call it for short. Um, this is a patient, the forefoot imaged approximately 10 months apart. You can see a very extensive ossified lesion here in the first web space. And with time, the lesion has grown and matured. And on the sagittal CT reconstruction, we see an extensive lobular area, a well-defined bone formation with internal trabeculation. And this is a maturing lesion of uh, <coughs> bizarre parosteal osteochondromatous proliferation. Again, the, the, the findings are fairly classical on imaging and they, we, we can save the patient a biopsy in the majority of cases. Within tendons, um, we have seen cases of poorly defined, fairly minimal um, calcification within tendons, sometimes associated with bone erosion. And these can, again, have fairly alarming features on MR, but we have to remember that calcific tendinopathy is a, is a a condition which can produce those features. We've seen it most commonly uh, presenting to the sarcoma service <laughs> in the insertion of gluteus maximus into the posterior thigh. And it's important just to remember the possibility of that diagnosis and to confirm the diagnosis with CT. <coughs> the other situations we've seen very extensive uh, ossification within tendons uh, is the post-traumatic situation which is akin, I think, to myositis of cans, whereas in the situation of tendons, we're seeing uh, a major tendon injury with extensive hemorrhage, which is ossified. So again, the clue to the diagnosis is really the anatomy. So here we see a case, uh, an AP plane radiograph uh, of the hip joint. We see a large bony mass extending from just the superlateral aspect of the acetabulum and extending down anterior and medial, which really conforms to the anatomical location of the rectus femoris tendon. And this is confirmed on the CT study here, where we can see that it's arising from the uh, reflected head of rectus femoris here, just superlateral to the acetabulum on the coronal and axial images. And we can continue and follow the ossification down into the tendon of the rectus femoris. So the diagnosis here is really made by looking at its anatomical location of the ossification and the calcification and locating it to the site of a known major tendon. <coughs>
As far as bond involvement is concerned, it was seen in about 14% of cases. Uh, and again, maybe surprisingly, um, only about a fifth of those uh, were due to sarcoma. Uh, in my experience, bone involvement with sarcoma is very, very uncommon. So if you see bone erosion, uh, or uh, the other types of things that can happen here, bone erosion, medullary extension, periosteal response, then in fact you're more likely to be dealing with either a benign neoplasm or a non-neoplastic lesion. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a soft tissue mass erosing bone is an aggressive uh, tumour or a sarcoma. Cortical erosion is the commonest uh, type of bone erosion uh, and we see it commonly in the fingers and toes with giant cell tumour of tendon sheath. Um, when you see cortical erosion uh, in a major bone though, we do have to think of sarcoma. But again, we can see cortical erosion around joints in non-neoplastic conditions such as uh, chronic synovitis. What do you expect to see with a, a slowly growing soft tissue mass uh, on plain film and sometimes on other imaging techniques such as MR and CT is that the lesion will have uh, caused a chronic scalloping of the outer cortex and commonly has uh, a sclerotic margin to it as we can see here in the lateral malleolus soft tissue mass causing very chronic scalloping of the, uh, uh, of the bone and that's appreciated on the axial PD weighted images as this black line here so this is a chronic lesion likely to be benign uh, because of the long-standing nature of the radiographic finding. Cortical erosion, again, with a soft tissue mass in the fingers or toes, almost always we're dealing with giant cell tumour of tendon sheath. So we see the plain film findings here uh, in the ring finger, an erosion of the bone here with a soft tissue mass, and also seen here on the lateral radiograph and the corresponding MR study. So this is very, very likely to be giant cell tumour of tendon sheath. If the lesion has the classical low signal on T2-weighted images, then we're fairly confident with the diagnosis based purely on imaging and we would not biopsy these cases. Intramedullary extension um, is uncommon with primary soft tissue tumours and one of the things that needs to be differentiated here is whether the lesion actually began within bone or began within soft tissue and secondarily involved the bone. Again, with the lesions of the small joints of the hands and, uh, and feet, we're talking mainly about giant cell tumour. Um, we can see it occasionally with sarcoma, and as I've mentioned before, uh, we can see chronic erosion resulting in intramedullary extension with non-neoplastic conditions such as chronic synovitis. So this is an example. Uh, a young child with a focal lytical lesion in the distal radius. You can see that it's got a, a well-defined sclerotic margin and it's causing very mild expansion of the volar cortex. And the question is whether this is a primary bone lesion, which it appears to be, or whether this is a secondary erosion from a soft tissue tumour. Uh, when we look at the MRI study, we can see that the vast majority of the abnormality, and this is a later study than uh, we, we've seen at this time, but the vast majority of the abnormality that's causing this erosion uh, is lying within soft tissues, and therefore we make the presumption that this is a primary soft tissue lesion which has resulted in secondary erosion of the bone. But sometimes it can be difficult to uh, make this differentiation. Again, intramedullary extension does not necessarily imply malignant disease. This is another case of fibromatosis, this time in the thigh. Uh, I think it's very unusual in my experience for fibromatosis to cause bone, uh, bone erosion. The appearances can sometimes be quite aggressive, as you see on the plain film here very poorly defined lytic lesion within bone. We can't identify a sclerotic margin as we saw in the other cases, but the MRI study demonstrates a mainly extraskeletal lobular mass with secondary erosion of the bony cortex. So no actual medullary invasion, but uh, invasion of the endosteal cortex here. Periosteal reaction, again, can be seen uh, adjacent to soft tissue masses. Um, it's not particularly helpful in differentiating between benign and malignant tumours, but again, can be seen commonly with chronic myositis of uh, um, in about 45% of their cases. Um, when we see periosteal response, it's usually chronic thickening of the periosteum, and I've shown you one case already, which I'll just show you again here, uh, with the adjacent phleboliths, in my experience, the commonest benign lesion to result in some kind of periosteal response is uh, a slow flow vascular malformation. Uh, and again, we've identified that by the phleboliths demonstrated on the plain radiograph. Then, miscellaneous conditions. Um, whenever you come across 
uh, the MR appearances of what looks like um, a chronic abscess. So here we see a coronal T1-weighted image following contrast. We can see an enhancing soft tissue mass with an irregular central non-enhancing cavity. It has the appearances of an abscess. We can see also enhancing muscle edema around the lesion. Um, and when chatting to this young boy um, at the time of proposed ultrasound-guided biopsy, he told me that a couple of weeks earlier he had fallen off his bicycle, and that uh, just raised an alarm bell. So we did a lateral soft tissue radiograph and identified the small uh, radiopaque foreign body, which had resulted in these findings. So this, in fact, was uh, a foreign body granuloma rather than a primary soft tissue abscess. So always think about the possibility of foreign body granuloma when the imaging features on MR are consistent with a fairly chronic abscess. And then very occasionally, we do see uh, what appears to be gas within uh, a soft tissue mass. This is an elderly lady who presented with a large mass on the medial side of her lower arm adjacent to the elbow joint. Uh, you can see it here, areas of gas within this big fungating tumor. Uh, and this is a rare finding, but indicates uh, communication obviously with the skin uh, um, and suggestive of either a fungating sarcoma or possibly uh, an abscess. And this is the axial T1-weighted post-contrast study, which shows this large tumor uh, in the subcutaneous tissues uh, extending through the skin. Don't forget looking at the subcutaneous tissues. Um, we've mentioned mainly the deep soft tissue so far, but occasionally we can see abnormality in the subcutaneous tissues. So here on the medial side of the distal arm, we can see kind of reticular soft tissue shadowing in the subcutaneous fat compared with the normal subcutaneous fat on the lateral side, which is very, very clean with a clear margin to the soft tissues. Soft tissue, deep soft tissue margin here is blurred, and we see this reticular soft tissue swelling, uh, and that indicates an inflammatory lesion within the soft tissues. This, in fact, turned out to be uh, inflammatory lymphadenopathy due to infection, uh, as shown on the MRI study. So in conclusions, um, radiography plays, I think, a secondary role in the characterization of soft tissue tumors and tumor diagnostic lesions. We do not routinely perform plain radiographs. The majority of our patients would be referred with an MR study. If we have a radiograph available, then we will assess it according to the principles that I've discussed already. But usually, in my experience, it does not aid in the diagnosis of soft tissue tumors. Thank you. Now, um, Musculoskeletal infection, just a, as a short introduction, we know it can you know, involve many aspects of the skeleton, appendicular, axial skeleton. Within bone, it uh, is termed osteomyelitis, which can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Uh, within joint, it can be septic arthritis or manifest as an infective bursitis. Uh, within soft tissues, we can have primary muscle infection, pyomyositis, or maybe soft tissue abscess. It can you know, arise de novo, or being bloodborne, or from direct inoculation, or predisposed by immunosuppression or diabetes, or it can be a postoperative uh, in terms of spinal infections or infected instrumentation. And in terms of uh, the different organisms, it can be biogenic, usually Staph aureus, occasionally Pseudomonas in drug addicts, and maybe Salmonella in patients with sickle cell disease, Granul granulomatous infection with TB particularly, and then fungal infection maybe with Candida. So it really, it's a very extensive topic and impossible to cover all of those things um, in, in 20 to 25 minutes. So what I want to do, just to limit uh, the topic here, is to talk about bone joint or soft tissue lesions that may mimic tumor. So these are really patients who are presenting to a tumor service uh, with a potential <coughs> bone or soft tissue tumor. Uh, and they're presenting with focal bone joint or pain, maybe with or without swelling, and usually no systemic symptoms or abnormalities of the inflammatory markers. So they're presenting clinically with a bone or soft tissue tumor. And I want to just go through some of the features that would indicate that in fact that this is a bone or soft tissue infection rather than a tumor. Um, what I also want to do is to talk a little bit about differential diagnosis because there are some conditions which can mimic chronic infections of bone and soft tissue, which if we can identify them and characterize them on imaging alone, can save the patient a needle biopsy and also save the patient what is commonly a very unrewarding prolonged course of antibiotic therapy. Start by talking about bone abscess. This was initially diagnosed or described in 1832 by um, Sir Benjamin Collins Brodie. So the name of the lesion, Brodie's abscess, is taken after him. He was a consultant orthopedic surgeon at St. George's Hospital. Uh, and it represents a subacute osteomyelitis, which is a walled-off bone 
intramedullary abscess, usually staphylococcal origin, and, but in about 50% of cases, no organism is cultured. And it's most commonly metaphyseal in location, but can extend into the epiphysis of, after closure of the growth plate, and also in the very young child when the epiphyseal vessels uh, do still cross the growth plate. So it's the lesion of children and young adults. The mean age in one series was just under 20 years. The patients present with pain and uh, some loss of function. And it can last for a long, long time. So again, you know, when you have a lesion with symptoms lasting up to years, we're thinking much more or very unlikely of infection. And as I've mentioned before, the blood results are usually normal, only minimally raised. Uh, it's more commonly seen in the lower limb and the commonest bone is the tibia. And the importance of making the diagnosis uh, is not just f uh, f for that fact in itself, but uh, it has a very excellent outcome uh, in terms of treatment with curatage and antibiotic treatment. So it's important to be able to make the diagnosis uh, early. As far as images con imaging is concerned, um, what we see on radiography is an irregular bone cavity, usually with some medullary sclerosis and possibly with some associated periosteal response. What we would expect to see um, on MRI uh, is some marrow edema. I would never make a diagnosis of, of, of an active bone abscess in the absence of any marrow edema. There may be associated soft tissue edema, and depending on the location of the lesion, you may see some reactive joint effusion. An important sign, which we'll discuss in a little bit of detail, um, which is almost diagnostic of a bone abscess, is the penumbra sign. In addition to uh, radiography and MR, CT may be helpful by demonstrating a sequestrum. <coughs> so these are the classical features. Um, on the lateral plane radiograph, it's difficult to actually appreciate the lesion itself, but we do see some marrow sclerosis, comparing the metaphysis to the diaphysis and the epiphysis. What we see on the coronal T1-weighted image, marrow sclerosis and edema manifest by some loss of medullary signal on T1, increased signal on STIR, and an irregular elongated bone cavity surrounded by a sclerotic margin here. And one of the important features of, uh, I think, for, for bone abscess as opposed to tumour is the irregularity and haphazard nature of the bone destruction. Uh, and this is a very unusual shape for any, any kind of tumour, the slit-like cavity within the bone. And this is very suggestive of, uh, of a bone abscess rather than a tumour. Again, another case, we can see an irregular uh, lesion in the distal metaphysis of the tibia. Now, when we look at the, just the plain radiograph, all we have is a lytic tumour um, causing mild bone expansion and a bit of periosteal response on the posterior aspect of the tumour uh, of the tibia with some soft tissue swelling. And I think at this stage, we cannot say that we're dealing with an abscess or whether this is a tumour. Once we see the MR, we see the sign that I've mentioned to you, the penumbra sign. This represents an area of mildly increased signal around the margin of the tumour uh, and surrounding the necrotic centre, sometimes seeing a rim of low signal due to sclerosis, but then seeing the extensive medullary edema uh, on both the T1-weighted and fat-suppressed T2-weighted images, and this time also with the associated soft tissue edema here. So this is the penumbra sign which we need to look for when suggesting a diagnosis of bone abscess. Uh, when we give contrast, as we have in this case in the heel, we would expect it to enhance strongly. Um, it can be from between 2 to 5 millimetres in thickness, and in this study, um, which described it initially in 1998, it was seen in about 75% of cases and histologically represents a vascularised granulation tissue within the abscess wall, uh, and the non-enhancing area representing the, the pus formation within the abscess. In this other study, published more recently, uh, it was only seen in about 27% of bone abscesses, but it has a very, very high specificity, 96% for the differentiation of infection from tumour. So it's a very important uh, sign to look for, the penumbra sign. Give gadolinium, you'll see it enhance, and this is a very, very strong indicator that you're dealing with a bone abscess as opposed to a bone tumour. Another example here, a distal radial lesion in a young lady. Again, we see a lytic lesion expanding the bone on T1. We've given contrast. Both the edema here is enhancing and the thin uh, wall of the abscess is also enhancing strongly. Another feature which we see with bone abscess is break through the cortex to form uh, either a soft tissue abscess or inflammation in the soft tissues. And this focal break in the cortex, again, is typical of um, infection rather than tumour. <coughs>
This is another example where there's um, more abnormality, in fact, in the soft tissues than in the bone. So this does make you wonder whether the infection started within soft tissue or, in fact, it started within bone. Um, what we see on the anterior side of the shin is this large abscess. Again, the abscess in the soft tissue showing the penumbra sign. A lot of associated soft tissue inflammation in the subcutaneous fat and again a focal break through the cortex and the associated abnormality in the bone. And this was a case of uh, tuberculosis resulting in secondary soft tissue abscess formation. It's been my experience in young children where the growth plate hasn't fused yet that the lesion is almost always eccentric and metaphyseal in location as we see in this case of the distal femur. And it's very, very common for the abscess to cross the open growth plate and enter the epiphysis. Uh, and this is almost always seen in, in, in small children. We see it on the plain film here. We see it very nicely on the MR study here, crossing the growth plate. We see the edema in the epiphysis as opposed to the normal fatty epiphysis here. And this is an example where CT has been helpful in showing a small sequestrum within the lesion. Uh, and this is another example of bone abscess, this time in a young child. Uh, and just to emphasize that point again here, uh, a distal ulnar bone abscess this time, adjacent to the metaphysis, crossing into the epiphysis, nicely demonstrated on the CT, and again showing sequestrum formation. So we would not routinely do CT to look for sequestrum, but again, if we do CT, then it's worth looking for that sign to again uh, give a stronger indication that we're dealing with um, bone uh, infection rather than bone tumour. Just an example of um, an abscess in the patella. We've seen several of these, mostly tuberculous in origin, just to show that the associated synovitis that can be seen uh, in lesions arising uh, around the joints. And again, evidence of some sequestrum formation on the CT study. <coughs> so in conclusion, as far as bone abscess is concerned, um, I think we should consider it whenever a lesion shows irregular margins as opposed to the fairly well-defined margins of benign bone tumours and when there is extensive marginal reactive sclerosis. What we should always expect to see on MRI in an active bone abscess is fairly extensive marrow edema, maybe with associated soft tissue edema. And what we should always look for in um, being a very specific indication of the diagnosis is the penumbra sign on the non-contrast T1-weighted images. So I want to talk a little bit about tuberculous osteomyelitis. Um, there are several aspects to TB osteomyelitis which I think are interesting because it can mimic uh, tumour and it can mimic neoplastic disease. Again, just from the clinical point of view, this was a study published back in 1997 from India where uh, the authors described 28 lesions in 25 patients presenting over a seven-year period. And just to note again, the, the long uh, potential length of uh, symptoms can you know, last over three years. Um, and the bone pain is usually unresponsive to analgesias. So again, the long length of um, presentation in, in bone abscess should not necessarily put you off the diagnosis of a potential infection within bone. As far as TB osteomyelitis is concerned, uh, three patterns of uh, abnormality were demonstrated on the uh, imaging in their cases. A classical bone abscess, as we've already described, um, the features of chronic osteomyelitis, which I think you're all aware of, and then the granulomatous lesion, which I think is a very unusual and rare presentation uh, in my own experience. This is just an example of um, a TB granuloma within bone, uh, a young lady presenting with ankle pain. On the plain radiograph, we see uh, just an area of poorly defined bone lysis containing some mild increased bone density. Uh, there's no expansion of the bone or cortical destruction. Very difficult to appreciate the lesion itself on MRI. What we do see is extensive marrow edema and soft tissue edema. We can't clearly identify the lesion itself. But on CT, we beautifully demonstrate this large granuloma with a thin lytic margin and mild surrounding sclerosis. And this is an example of a TB granuloma within bone. This was biopsy-proven tuberculosis. The second point I want to make about TB is the relative frequency with which it presents as multifocal disease. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple of cases. This is a young lady presenting to the sarcoma service with two masses on her chest wall. So here we have one seen on the CT study uh, on the right side of the inferior chest wall related to the rib. 
and the second on the left side of the upper chest wall related to the sternum with extension into the pectoralis major muscle here. Staging CT of the chest uh, demonstrated no abnormality in the chest but two foci of sclerosis within the thoracic spine, one associated with a, full, uh, a paravertebral mass. <coughs> so this is all looking very concerning for possible multifocal metastatic disease. We went on to image the whole of the spine and we can see that she's got multifocal spinal abnormalities with what appears to be infiltration of the vertebral bodies. There's no end plate destruction, no disc involvement. If there's paravertebral involvement here and also soft tissue involvement into the epidural space with impending cord compression. So when we see these features, really, we have no option but to say that this is, this is widespread metastatic disease, maybe lymphoma. But when we look a bit more carefully, we see some features which uh, point to tuberculosis. And the, the two features we saw in this case were the subligament is spread deep to the PLL. Again, note that the discs are completely normal and the end plates are intact. And then on the axial and coronal images, we demonstrated these large psoas abscesses, which really gave the game away. And this is an example of multifocal tuberculous osteomyelitis uh, presenting with what we thought was uh, metastatic disease. So again, as a conclusion for TB osteomyelitis, I think always consider it in certain patient groups. For us, it's the uh, Asian subcontinent. Remember the possibility of TB again when there's multifocal disease, even in the absence of any disc or end plate involvement in the spine. We've seen several cases of intracortical osteomyelitis, and these can present with uh, symptoms and signs which can mimic uh, osteoid osteoma, but it's not quite the same. This is a young man presenting with chronic thigh pain. We see very little abnormality on the plain film, just a bit of rare refraction of the cortex here. Uh, again, we see the cortical abnormality here. There's very little marrow edema, but very extensive muscle edema. And on the axial images here, we see a very, very small lytic area containing a small area of low signal. And this was felt to represent an osteoid osteomonidus, but it was elongated on the CT study. And this extensive soft tissue edema with the absence of much medullary edema was much more in keeping with intracortical osteomyelitis and sequestrum formation as opposed to osteoid osteoma. This is another example with much more aggressive destruction of the posterior cortex here. And again, on the MRI study, we see the intracortical abscess with sequestrum formation, and this time an associated um, soft tissue abscess. As far as differential diagnosis is concerned, I think that any patient presenting with um, you know, bone pain has a lytic lesion on plain film or maybe medullary sclerosis on plain film. Uh, and shows marked medullary sclerosis or cortical thickening and edema on MRI. All of these features uh, can be seen with conditions which are not infection, but may mimic uh, low-grade infection within bone. There's three particular conditions that I just want to mention because the diagnosis can be made uh, fairly satisfactorily based purely on imaging uh, and um, save the patient any biopsy or antibiotic therapy. Stress fracture is one of them. Uh, one of the things to think about here, of course, as opposed to infection, is its relative diaphyseal location rather than a metaphyseal location. But again, we see an area of marrow edema on the MR study, which is not uh, accounted for on MR because we can't see, you can't see any um, associated bone lesion to cause this. Much more extensive on the stir sequence, as we can see here and here, with periosteal response and, again, soft tissue edema. So the question is, is this acute subacute osteomyelitis? Whenever we see this combination of unexplained bone marrow edema uh, with or without associated periosteal response, we always assess the patient further with a CT study. And here we can see the cause of the lesion being uh, an oblique longitudinal stress fracture of the medial diaphyseal cortex of the tibia. The second condition to always think about is chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. This is a condition of unknown etiology. It's a non-bacterial osteitis, so uh, we've seen it enough now that we can recognize it on imaging. We don't biopsy it anymore. We certainly don't treat it with antibiotics. The commonest site in our practice uh, is the medial third of the clavicle. It's usually unilateral. This is an unusual case in which it's bilateral, but notice medial uh, clavicular location. It can have fairly aggressive appearances on MRI. The bone can be expanded. There can be irregular cavities within the bone. It will show a variable degree of edema depending on the stage of the lesion. But we should not see any true soft tissue mass, and usually we don't see any associated lymphadenopathy. And again, it's the medial location within the clavicle which is very important for suggesting the diagnosis. 
When it occurs in long bones, it can occur uh, when the patient has an immature skeleton adjacent to the open growth plate as multiple small lytic lesions with a sclerotic margin. Whereas in the shafts of the long bones, uh, either the major long bones or the small long bones, it can result in very marked bone expansion, cortical thickening and sclerosis. Uh, and this is two examples here uh, on your left hand side of one in, the, one in the femur and one in the metatarsal. All of these features being those of chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. Intramedullary osteosclerosis is a relatively rare condition. Uh, we've seen it most commonly in young to middle-aged females, again, most commonly in the tibial diaphysis. And what we see on plain film is a mild area of bone expansion with medullary sclerosis, which can obliterate the medullary cavity. Um, again, depending on its level of activity, we may see associated marrow edema, as we see in this case. And this is what makes uh, us worried about the possibility of infection, of a chronic infection. Um, but it's a condition now we clearly recognize and the obliteration of the medullary cavity is very, very nicely demonstrated on CTs. But this is a, a diagnosis now we recognize on imaging and it's managed uh, basically purely symptomatically. As far as soft tissue infection is concerned, uh, we see soft tissue abscess you know, presenting as tumors only uh, in the situation where the classical clinical findings are not there. So usually it's a, a typical clinical Im imaging diagnosis, a painful swollen uh, red limb with the appropriate imaging. But when we have a cold abscess um, with very few symptomatic sim uh, systemic symptoms, it can present uh, clinically as a sarcoma. Um, again, with soft tissue masses, it's worth looking for the penumbra sign. We see it in this case here. Uh, any soft tissue abscess, as we have said with a bone abscess, we would expect to see associated surrounding edema, both in the subcutaneous fat and in the adjacent muscles. And again, we can see this deep extension here into the uh, multifidus muscle uh, and rectus spinae. And this was a soft tissue abscess due to TB in, in a young man. But sometimes we don't see the sort of inflammatory nature of the lesion. This is a, a, a middle-aged lady presenting with a massively swollen shoulder. Uh, and a huge, what turned out to be, um, subdeltoid subacromial bursitis with rice body formation. Um, and in this situation, really, there's two diagnoses we think of. Again, in the Asian population, uh, this turned out to be uh, a case of tuberculous bers uh, bursitis. And again, note here, the multiple axillary lymph nodes, which we would not expect to see uh, in a soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, and the other condition, of course, is a first presentation of chronic rheumatoid disease. Foreign body, again, is something worth thinking about. This is a young boy who presented to us with uh, pain in the posterior medial aspect of the knee. The plain radiograph looks normal. The MR study is very suggestive of a fairly extensive uh, soft tissue abscess around the lateral, posterior, and medial aspect of the knee, as we can see here. Uh, and we admitted him for a CT-guided biopsy to try and identify the organism. But at CT this time, we demonstrated this very, very tiny radiopaque foreign body, uh, even though he had no history whatsoever of any trauma. And when we look back at the plain film, I think we just about can, uh, if I can get the arrow to work, see the lesion here now uh, on the plain radiograph uh, retrospectively. So always remember the possibility of a foreign bloody granuloma in any patient presenting with a fairly low-grade soft tissue abscess. So a rapid run through some unusual aspects maybe of musculoskeletal infection. It has a very variable clinical and imaging presentation. We must be able to make a diagnosis of Brody's abscess. Uh, nowadays we send our patients, once we're happy with the diagnosis, for primary surgical curatage and, and antibiotic treatment. We should always consider TB in the correct ethnic population, irrespective of how uh, classical the features may look for metastatic disease. Remember the diagno you know, differential diagnostic possibilities, but also, of course, whenever there is any doubt, uh, biopsy, uh, sending uh, material both histopathological and microbiological assessment. Thank you very much. The, uh, the final lecture now uh, is on a completely different uh, subject. So we're going to go to um, um, imaging of the lumbar spine, looking at some aspects of 
uh, degenerative disc disease and uh, lumbar spondylolisthesis. It's a very, very extensive topic. Again, I'll have to rush through it uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, and the clinical manifestations of disc degeneration are relatively limited. It can present purely with low back pain, which may be discogenic or maybe due to incrosseous disc herniation. Uh, it can present with disc prolapse and nerve root compression and also really commonly in the older population with spinal stenosis. But the most important first point to make is that the imaging findings of disc degeneration can be completely um, asymptomatic. Um, so in this study, for instance, where this was a large population study, they found that 40% of individuals under 30 years of age had lumbar disc degeneration on MRI. And the prevalence increases to over 90% by the age of 50 to 55 years. Although there is a positive correlation between disc degeneration scores and low back pain, uh, we have to admit that we wouldn't expect 40% of our population under the age of 30 years to have significant low back pain. So lumbar disc degeneration is very, very common. Its incidence increases with age, and we have to understand that it's commonly seen uh, in the absence of any significant low back symptoms. So the important point, I think, which has to be made at this stage is that there has to be an accurate correlation between symptoms, signs, and MRI findings in particular before any surgical in, um, intervention is take, undertaken. And the accurate diagnosis, more and more, now is falling upon our hands uh, rather than clinical assessment uh, in being able to make an accurate and concise uh, diagnosis on MRI. We start talking about discogenic low back pain. Uh, the concept of internal disc disruption was introduced in 1970 where it suggested that some trauma to the disc results in an annular tear, which sets up the presence of chemical irritants within the nucleus pulposus and re of the posterior degenerate annulus. Uh, these the chemical irritants and the new nerve fibers within the annulus uh, acting uh, as sources of potential pain. Presents with low back pain, which is worse on flexion, which can radiate to the buttocks and groins and thighs, but classically does not extend beyond the knee. And the MR features we will see are the degenerate discs, so loss of T2 weighted signal on, on uh, MR, loss of disc height, maybe disc bulge, we know those well. Uh, we'll see possibly a high intensity zone, and we maybe see the modic end plate changes. And on discography, um, we will identify uh, in the positive cases a deep radial annular tear, uh, and the patient will show concordant pain response on injection of the disc. So we start by talking about the high intensity zone. Now, this is defined as a focal area of increased signal within the posterior annulus of a degenerate disc on T2 weighted images, uh, described initially 20 years ago now. Uh, in the British Journal of Radiology. And this lesion will enhance following contrast because it does contain vascularized granulation tissue. At discography, it corresponds with a deep radial annular tear. And histologically, as I've mentioned, it contains vascularized granulation tissue. And newer studies have also demonstrated the presence of uh, anti-TNF positive cells and some CD68 positive cells, these being um, markers of pain production. So these are the classical imaging findings on T1, T2, and contrast enhanced imaging. At the L4, L5 level, we see a degenerate disc. Disc height is maintained. A small posterior bulge, but a focal high intensity zone seen just here, which enhancing following contrast. We don't see it on the T1 weighted images. We identify it also on the axial images within the central posterior aspect of the annulus. So when such a disc is injected, what we would expect to see, this is the normal L3, L4 disc, which is contained with an intact annulus, with early injection of the L4, L5 disc, we're seeing a deep, full thickness posterior annular tear within uh, free rain, uh, running of contrast medium deep to the PLL. So this is what we expect to see when we have this appearance on MR. The, the critical feature though, however, is whether on injection of the disc, the patient uh, experiences pain, which is very, very similar in nature and uh, location to the pain that you present with during uh, their daily lives. As far as the relationship to pain is concerned, the initial studies uh, were all performed on patients who had been referred for lumbar discography. So this was a very select patient group, uh, which led to a marked bias in the, in the results. It's shown to have a very high specificity for pain reproduction at discography, uh, around 90% or more. But we found that it has a very low sensitivity as a marker of an annular tear. So only about 25% of patients who have an annular tear at discography would manifest a high intensity zone at MRI. 
This improves somewhat uh, when the disc uh, high intensity zone is associated with a small disc protrusion. Uh, so when you have an abnormality of disc contour as well, as you can see in this case here, the um, sensitivity goes up to nearly 50% and the specificity is maintained at uh, in the high 90s. But the problems with the high intensity zone are it's firstly it's relatively low sensitivity and secondly the fact that in many studies now um, it has been described in patients who have no back pain or no significant back pain whatsoever uh, and that can be seen in between 25 or a quarter to half the cases of patients with either no back pain or minimal symptoms can actually have a high intensity zone at one or more lumbar discs on MRI. So the reliability as a marker of the painful disc is therefore questionable uh, when we just take it as uh, an individual finding. Modic changes, we know these are reactive end plate changes uh, adjacent to a degenerate disc. Three types are described, but they may be mixed and they may commonly progress with time. So a type one change may progress on healing to a type two change and so on. This is the type one change where we have the so-called inflammatory type with reduction of the T1-weighted signal adjacent to the disc, increased signal T2 in stir, and this is the inflammatory type, uh, which is relatively uncommon. The commonest type we see is the fatty change where there's increased signal uh, adjacent to the degenerate disc on both T1 and T2-weighted images. That suggests a degree of healing. And again, relatively uncommonly, we see the type three change, which is reduced signal on both T1 and T2, which corresponds uh, to fibrosis and sclerosis of the marrow adjacent to the disc. Now what we have found uh, in terms of literature, search uh, and research as far as modic changes is concerned, that it's actually very uncommon in an asymptomatic population. So it is suggestive of being a marker of a degenerate disc. When we compare modic changes with discography, again, we find a very high specificity. So a disc with modic changes seen on MRI injected at discography is very likely to be a painful disc. But again, as with the high intensity zone, it has a very low sensitivity of around 30%, and therefore, again, has a limited value as a marker of painful disc degeneration. So the summary of discogenic low back pain, uh, we need to remember that asymptomatic disc degeneration is relatively common on MRI. The his and the modic changes are specific but not particularly sensitive. So I think uh, the current status is that MRI alone is not accurate or reliable enough for the identification of a painful disc uh, prior to uh, potential spinal fusion. Uh, and therefore discography may still have uh, a place to play uh, in the identification of which disc is causing pain uh, prior to any surgery. We're going to move on to talk about disc prolapse. Two types in relation to low back pain. Um, relatively uncommonly we can have an acute reactive Schmalz node penetrating the uh, end plate into the marrow cavity and resulting in acute low back pain. Much more common in practice is the disc prolapse into the uh, spinal canal, resulting in either cord equina or nerve root compression. This is an example of an acute Schmalz node at the L4-L5 level, and this also illustrates another problem. Um, we've got a big Schmalz node in the inferior end plate of L4. Commonly, we see the type 1 reactive end plate change adjacent to it. With gadolinium, the reactive change and the node will enhance. But this is compounded by the fact that the L4-L5 disc is also degenerate with a posterior high-intensity zone. So it doesn't really, you know, it leads to a problem as to which of these lesions, if not both, if either, you know, if either of them is actually causing the back pain. But when we see a relatively large Schmalz node, particularly when it's associated with the type 1 reactive end plate changes, it may well be a cause of, of low back pain. One feature to be aware of, particularly in Schmalz nodes arising around the thoracolumbar junction is that a relatively small Schmalz node can result in very diffuse in, uh, marrow edema. So here we have a small end plate defect, and we can see in the superior end plate of L1, which has resulted in edema throughout the whole of the vertebral body, which is, man which is mimicking infiltration, uh, potentially due to a malignant tumor. So it's important to be aware of the possibility that this can be due to a small Schmalz node. We actually see the node on um, the axial T1-weighted images following contrast. I'm trying to get this arrow to work, but it won't work very well. Uh, if there's any doubt about the possibility of a Schmalz node as being the cause of this, then what we commonly do is to go on and do a CT study to look at the end plate in some more detail. <laughs> 
Um, the reactive changes around Schmoll's nodes can also progress. So on your right-hand side, we have type 1 reactive end plate changes in the superior end plate of L2 back in January 2011. And eight months later, they've on, progressed on to type 2 changes with healing of the node and presumably some uh, resolution of the patient's symptoms. Lumbar disc prolapse um, is a common problem. Uh, just in terms of definition, we need to diffu differentiate a disc bulge, which is a diffuse extension of disc material beyond the end plate seen on the axial images, from a disc hernia, which is a focal extension of disc material beyond the end plate on the axial images. Plain film has little role to play, but it may identify uh, an abnormality of lumbosacral transition, which is very important in terms of num you know, numbering the level of a disc prolapse, because Still, probably one of the commonest um, mistakes made in spinal surgery is to operate on the wrong level. Uh, and commonly, these patients uh, have an abnormality of lumbosacral transition, so this has to be uh, clarified in some way. Occasionally, an acute disc prolapse, particularly in the adolescent age group, can result in a, a patient presenting with scoliosis uh, rather than radiculopathy, so that's uh, something to be aware of. MR, of course, is very sensitive and very specific and will demonstrate the associated nerve root compression. Classifica classification of disc hernias is, is both on site and type. So we have four zones in the axial plane around the disc that we talk about. Uh, central, paracentral, foraminal, or subfacetal when it's actually within the foramen, or extra foraminal or far lateral when the disc pro prolapse is lateral to the foramen. And the prolapse can be classified further uh, in terms of its extent into a protrusion, extrusion, or a sequestration. So here we have an example at the uh, L4, L5 level of a central disc prolapse, uh, not associated with any nerve root compression. This is an example of a right paracentral L5S1 disc prolapse, which is probably an extrusion, although on the T2-weighted sagittal it does appear that the outer fibers of the annulus are intact, but this is a paracentral location. This is a left L3, L4 intraforaminal disc prolapse, and this is a left L4, L5 far lateral disc prolapse, as you can see here. Okay, So these are the four zones we talk about when reporting uh, disc prolapses in terms of the axial location of the lesion. We consider um, a prolapse to be a protrusion when the outer annular fibers are intact. And this is best assessed on the sagittal T2 weighted images, where we have the appearance of a low signal rim around the prolapse, suggesting that the outer fi fibers of the annulus are intact. When they are disrupted, as in this case, then we call it a disc extrusion, but the disc fragment is still in continuity with the parent disc. But when there is displacement or migration of the disc fragment from the parent disc, sometimes to an extent that it's difficult to know exactly which disc the lesion arose from, then we classify this as a sequestrated disc prolapse. Uh, and these are usually hyperintense on T2 because they absorb fluid from the um, uh, CSF space or the thecal uh, from the um, spinal canal and they can show enhancement, rim enhancement following contrast in T1 weighted images. And again note here on the T2 weighted image how hyper intense the lesion is compared to the degenerate disc. So that should not put you off uh, calling this a disc prolapse. What is essential in my view is whenever you make a diagnosis of disc prolapse and you're reporting this on MR is that you uh, state its relationship to the nerve root. So here for instance we have a very small right-sided uh, L5 S1 disc prolapse, which is clearly compressing and displacing the right S1 nerve root within the lateral recess. Whereas in this case, again, we have a very small left paracentral disc prolapse, which is in contact with the left S1 nerve root, but is not actually causing any nerve root compression or displacement. So I always feel it's important to talk about the relationship of the prolapse to the adjacent nerve root when reporting these cases. Again, disc herniations we know can commonly regress. This is a young lady who has very bad disc degenerative disease at multiple levels. Uh, back in March of 2009, she has a large left paracentral L2, L3 disc prolapse, which by July 2011 has resolved completely, but now she's developed a very, very large central L4, L5 disc prolapse, whereas before she just had a disc bulge, which is resulting in an acute corticoana compression uh, as we can see on the axial T2 weighted image here. So again, in summary, uh, as far as disc prolapse is concerned, we need to classify its location into these four uh, components, as I mentioned. Maybe describe its type potentially um, not of any importance now with the relatively lack of use of, uh, of minimally invasive techniques for management of disc lesions. Uh, 
uh, but always comment upon its relationship to the adjacent nerve root here. Finishing off now um, with lumbar spinal stenosis. Now this uh, represents a narrowing of the spinal canal, which can be multiple etiologies, uh, but we're going to speak only about uh, that related with degenerative disc disease. Again, it's classified according to its anatomical location, into central canal, lateral recess, and foraminal, but it's commonly multifocal and multilevel. Very important again then on MR to identify all of the sites and describe them all in your reports. And the important point, of course, is that it's a dynamic phenomenon. So the central canal is most compromised when the patient is in the erect and extended posture, where it's most capacious when the patient is in the supine flex posture. And of course, the supine flex posture is a position that we routinely image patients in uh, at the lumbar spine MRI. So potentially, uh, lumbar spine MR can miss clinically relevant spinal stenosis. In terms of imaging, the plain film, again, not particularly helpful. It may demonstrate a congenitally small canal. It may demonstrate uh, spondylolisthesis or maybe a degenerative scoliosis. MRI will show the site and cause uh, of any stenosis, but as we've mentioned, it's not a dynamic study. Uh, the routine MR we do in the supine position is not a dynamic study. So in a patient who has um, classical symptoms and signs of neurogenic claudication, but the MRI study shows no quarter equina compression. We have to think about doing something more. Um, we used to, until relatively recently, still perform functional myelography with CT in this clinical situation uh, to identify occult stenosis, but of course it's an invasive procedure and also many of our consultants now who are trained within the last 10 years have never even seen a myelogram, let, let alone performed one, so this is becoming a problem now. We do have access in London to upright positional MR, uh, this is a 0.6 phonar magnet, and I'll show you some examples of how that can be of benefit in this clinical situation. So what do you see on plain film, maybe? We see a de degenerative spondylolisthesis here on your right side, sorry, on your left side at the L4, L5 level. And on this side, we see uh, a degenerative scoliosis. So that's where plain film may show uh, some interesting findings. As far as central canal stenosis is concerned, the compressive features anteriorly are the bulging disc, and the posterolateral compression features are facet osteoarthritis with bulky osteophytes, thickening of the ligamentum flavum, and prominence of the posterior epidural fat pad. We see these here on MR, multi-level disc bulges. At this level, there's also some prominence of the posterior fat pad. We see facet osteoarthritis most marked on the left. But the combination of these features is resulting in compression of the thecal sac with absence of the CSF within the thecal sac on the T2-weighted image which suggests that there is associated quarter equina compression. Lateral recess stenosis has very similar features in terms of the causes of the compression, but they tend to be unilateral. And in addition, sometimes a medial osteophyte from the superior articular process can result in further lateral recess compromise. A facet ganglion is a very uh, important diagnosis to make because these can be successfully treated uh, with um, interventional needle techniques uh, under CT guidance. So these are the features of lateral recess stenosis. Uh, here a CT myelogram, which we don't see very often, showing the medial osteophyte from the superior articular process resulting in lateral recess stenosis and compression of the nerve root here. And here the unilateral, predominantly unilateral features of bulging disc, thickening of the ligamentum here, resulting in right-sided L5 nerve root compression at the L4, L5 disc level. This is a, a classical example of a facet ganglion, which is commonly associated with degenerative spondylolisthesis. And it's a potent cause of lateral recess stenosis. So we see the ganglion here on the sagittal tutu-weighted level image at the level of the slip. We see it here also on the coronal image here. And on the post-contrast T1-weighted image, we would expect the wall of the ganglion to enhance following contrast. And we see a compression of the traversing L5 nerve root. And these cases we commonly treat with percutaneous CT-guided facet injection or direct puncture of the lesion. Foraminal stenosis, again, the same components uh, of the bulging disc, but this time a superior osteophyte from the articular process may result in foraminal compromise. But a very potent cause of foraminal stenosis is reduced foraminal height due to spondylolisthesis, because spondylolisthesis results in a horizontal orientation of the foramen rather than the normal vertical orientation. And when that's combined with a degenerate bulging disc into the foramen, then it can result in very, very severe compression of the exiting nerve root. 
So here are a couple of examples of foraminal stenosis. The plain radiographic findings, we see reduction of foraminal height due to marked reduction of height of the degenerate disc and a small superior osteophyte also from the uh, um, articular process. But what we don't identify is how much further compromise there is due to bulging disc, which we will see on MRI. This is an example again of degenerative spondylolisthesis, and the classical pattern of foraminal compromise here is the involvement of the mid lumbar nerve roots on the, con on the concavity of the curve and the lower number lumbar nerve roots on the convexity of the curve. And this is the uh, left side of the curve um, in this particular patient where the L5 nerve root here is being trapped by the bulging disc, uh, as you can see here, both on the sagittal and on the axial images. Just a reminder that stenosis can be multifocal and due to multiple etiologies. So we have a facet ganglion bilateral at the L3, L4 level together with a bulging disc resulting in severe L3, L4 central canal stenosis. Whereas at L4, L5, there is a minimal spondylolisthesis resulting in further central canal stenosis at this level. And then the anterior slip of the interior, inferior articular process can result in lateral recess stenosis at the level of the superior end plate and uh, be a further potent cause of uh, L5 root compression in the situation of an L4, L5 spondylolisthesis. So just to finish off um, with mentioning the possibility or the reality of dynamic stenosis. These are uh, images obtained from the uh, upright scanner that we have access to. So a patient here with low back pain and claudication. The sagittal T2 weighted sequence shows a very minimal degenerative spondylolisthesis, but a very, very adequate central canal dimension as also seen on the axial images here. Note the presence of some fluid in the facet joint bilaterally. Okay? The patient was imaged uh, in the standing position. The spondylolisthesis has not particularly changed, but now there is complete loss of CSF from around the cord equina, marked compression of the thecal sac, cord equina compression, and the development of a small facet ganglion due to fluid being pushed out of the facet into this ganglion. And the patient has developed very significant cord equina compression. So this is clearly occult on supine MR. It was not even identified on sitting upright MR, but was demonstrated on standing MR. So occult stenosis is a, is a real problem that we have to remember, and we have to have some way of, of trying to make that diagnosis uh, on MRI. It can occur within the foramen as well. So here we have a patient, again, with L5 root symptoms. Um, the image on your right side shows the sitting position where the L5 root has some fat around it and is not compressed, whereas the standing image demonstrates the development of foraminal stenosis and compression of the exiting L5 nerve root. Do we have time to carry on, honey, or should I stop there? Two more minutes. Well, quickly, spondylolisthesis. Um, I'll miss the definitions. They should all be clear to you. Uh, the classification of lumbar spondylolisthesis is uh, very classical. The two important types, I think, clinically, are the lytic uh, spondylolisthesis and the degenerative, which we see most commonly in clinical practice. We can grade it according to the percentage of the slip or uh, grade from one to four. Um, and when we have a complete slip, usually seen with the dysplastic cases, that's termed spondyloptosis. The clinical features of degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis, or, or the lytic type rather, usually seen in the relatively younger patient, um, most commonly due to bilateral pars defects associated with a degenerate disc. The clinical features are listed there. Uh, it may present, or usually presents, with uh, severe radicular pain <coughs> due to compression of the nerve root within the foramen. And this is an example here of a lytic L4, L5 uh, spondylolisthesis associated with a very degenerate disc and the bulging of the disc into the foramen together with the horizontal orientation of the foramen is resulting in very severe compression of the exiting L4 nerve root. Degenerative spondylolisthesis is uh, relatively common uh, predisposed to by the sagittal orientation of the facets and the degenerate disc most commonly seen in middle-aged females at the L4, L5 level and they present with low back pain and neurogenic claudication. And this is a classical example here at the L4, L5 level with severe compromise of the thecal sac and the cord equina. So in conclusions, low back pain and leg pain are very common clinical problems. They have multiple causes which may coexist. But as I've mentioned already, the correlation between symptoms and abnormal imaging uh, 
is absolutely essential before any surgical um, any surgery is performed. Thank you very much. Asif for his uh, nice and rich informative presentations and for the uh, shortage of time uh, we would like to uh, go on for the next presentation and we'll leave a question for Dr. Asif to the end of the session. And please uh, welcome with me Dr. Khalid Al-Ismail. Dr. Khalid Al-Ismail is a consultant uh, MSK Radiology at King Faisal uh, Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. He's the president and the founder of the uh, Arabian Gulf Society of Skeletal Radiology, program director of MSK Radiology Fellowship in King Faisal Hospital, and he has uh, uh, plenty as much as 27 publications and articles in MSK Radiology. Uh, without further delay, uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Khad Ismail for his uh, presentation. <laughs> I want just to thank the uh, organizing committee uh, for uh, inviting me to share uh, about the spondylar arthritis. I find it so much difficult to uh, do lectures after pioneers. So I'll speak about uh, imaging of uh, spondyloarthropathies or arthritis. So it, it is a topic which is really uh, common nowadays and we should just go for it. Uh, I'll go for uh, some sort of basics and then we'll go for the advanced imaging. Before uh, starting that, I want just to announce about our second joint MAMS AGSSR meeting. It will be in uh, 14 to 17th of uh, February 2013, next month, inshallah. It will be in Doha, Qatar. So uh, the um, AMS is Asian Musculoskeletal Society and AGSSR is the Arabian Gulf Society of Skeletal radiology. There will be also a course uh, done by the ISS uh, regional outreach program. So I, I hope that people uh, would uh, uh, join us in, in Doha inshallah ta'ala. So uh, the lecture is going to be uh, about these uh, uh, introduction. We'll go for the clinical important data and then we'll go for the pathophysiology which I believe that we should know about the pathophysiology of the diseases so we can tell about the uh, uh, radiological manifestations of the disease. Then we'll speak about uh, spondy uh, ankylosing spondylitis as an example of um, uh, spondyloarthropathy. The uh, role of uh, radiographs, MRR, uh, would be discussed as well, and these are the most advanced uh, topics nowadays um, in uh, rheumatological disorders. And then we'll end up with, uh, with the uh, discussion. Most of us, as um, um, in the usual day-to-day -day work, will be faced with this type of examination. Sometimes we think that it is so much difficult or not difficult, but uh, what I mean from presenting this one is that we should have a systematic way for uh, um, looking at the joint x-rays. So for, for this case, and I think that everybody can see that um, the alignment is maintained the bone density is slightly reduced, especially around the joints, and the um, joints are pseudo-widened. They are not really widened too much, but they are uh, distracted. That's why you see it, uh, that they are more wider than the usual adjacent joint, which are normal. Some of the soft tissue swelling and the sausage-like digit involvement of the distal uh, aspect, this is psoriatic arthropathy. So this is a typical presentation of uh, psoriatic arthritis. So if we just concentrate on a systematic approach, if you are reading the uh, joints, so just go to A, B, C, D, S, alignment, bone, cartilage, which is joint spaces, and then distribution, is it proximal, distal, or the soft tissue, is there any soft tissue swelling or soft tissue calcification, etc. You should analyze every joint in, in as, as a separate joint, and uh, there are too many types of uh, scoring systems has been used for the evaluation of the joint spaces and the uh, arthritis cases. But the most important two issues which you should go and analyze is, the jo uh, is there any erosions or not, and is there any joint narrowing or widening or pseudo-widening. These are the most important reliable indicators for the joint 
um, uh, arthritis uh, changes. Spondyloarthritis is a, a broad term, and it is a family of diseases we know. And uh, it's very important to know that it is, uh, has been labeled previously as a seronegative arthritis. This term is not anymore used uh, because some of these cases has positivity of the rheumatoid, fa rheumatoid fa factor. So it's very important to know now the, the seronegative arthritis has been replaced by the spondyloarthritis, uh, which is uh, consistent of different diseases. If you go for the spectrum of the diseases, they are uh, um, a very uh, large group. But the most important ones is the, the ankylosing spondylitis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, which is writer's disease, and the uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease. These are the most important four. But if you know uh, somebody speaking about, uh, you find somebody speaking about undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, it is the spondyloarthritis at the presentation, there is no evidence of sacroiliitis. So it is uh, arthritis, uh, which is spondyloarthritis affecting mainly, started to affect the spine first and then it will present itself with the sacroiliitis uh, picture. The acute anterior uh, uh, uveitis and uh, idiopathic AV block as a, uh, a disease also known. And juvenile part of the disease is very well known nowadays and it is taken very heavily as management um, uh, direction. The uh, human leuc leukocyte antigen positivity on these diseases uh, is very common and uh, uh, some of the textbook wa was mentioning that there's about 100% of those patients, especially ankylosing spondylitis, would have um, a positivity of the disease. Some of other papers, they are saying that there's 75% to 95% ranging for the positivity. So what is important here is that uh, we know that it is associated with HLA positivity uh, uh, to have the um, uh, uh, disease. The pathology of spondyloarthritis is very important to start with an inflammation. So if you have inflammation, granulomatous disease, inflammatory cells infiltration of the subchondral region, this is a start point of the disease. And then it will be reactive bone, might be sclerosis or resorption, so it depends on the uh, disease um, uh, activity or uh, disease severity. Then there will be bone remodeling and then there might be a sort of fibrocartilaginous proliferation and ending up with the joint space uh, narrowing and fusion. The other point is that the spondylar arthritis is um, very commonly you see in thesitis. And the third one, which is a tenosynovitis at the digits. So it's an important uh, areas which you see that inflammation is there, enthesitis is there, and uh, there might be a fiction of the periphery. Let us have an example for a patient which is 42 uh, male patient. This patient has a pincer-like, probably, uh, uh, AFI, uh, which is a stabular femoral impingement type of uh, arthritis, probably. But the most important issue here is that if you see the site of attachment of the tendons into the bone in the ischial tuberosity, ischial bone, or the infra inferior pubic ramus, and also at the site of attachment of rectus femoris and the site of attachment of the sartorius muscles, uh, greater trochanteric attachment there. So these are the ossification, calcification of the tendinous um, uh, um, uh, ligamentous um, uh, uh, portion of the bone attachment. So it is, this is what we meant about enthesitis. You, you might see some sort of uh, things called enthesophyte, especially if you see it in the posterior aspect of the calcaneus at the site of attachment of the Achilles tendon. So these are the, the sites where you really can see those uh, enthesopathy or enthesitis. We know the basic knowledge about ankylosing spondylitis radiographic manifestations. For instance, in this case, we see one of the things which is in here, which is a shining corner uh, sign or Romanos lesion. So it's really important if you see um, one of these signs, just go search for other signs. If you have a squaring of the vertebral body, that means it is the other sign. And if you see some sort of facetal joint arthritis or more reactive arthritis in those areas, think about uh, spondyloarthritis. Uh, as we said, that uh, there might be also some sort of endosopathy, but there is also something which is called 
trolley tracker sign where you see that the fusion of the uh, facetal joints like the way uh, for the tram. So it is the trolley tracker sign. You can see them on this spine uh, x-ray. These are the, uh, the, the things which is really important to know. If you see that the joint spaces are reduced, these are most likely a type of ankylosis. So this is another sign to search for with. This is a most um, uh, common sign which is really uh, known to everybody, which is a bamboo spine sign, which is the uh, syndesmotic uh, ossification of the ligaments. This is an, an interesting uh, finding as well. If you see this one, you should not miss it. This is a dagger sign, which is the al khanjar uh, and it is a very important uh, sign to, to, to say that this is a latent stage of the disease as well, which is the um, uh, ossification of the interspinous ligament. The dagger sign is there, the trolley uh, tracker sign is there, the fusion of the uh, SI joints are also there, but you see even lumbo iliolumbar uh, ligament calcification or ossification is another sign for the spondyloarthritis. This is a case of a 32 years female patient, feeling of a deep pelvic pain. But if you see that this patient has bilateral sacroiliitis, more evidently seen on the right side. And if you see that this much of sclerosis at the symphysis pubis, you can link these two informations that uh, osteitis pubis is one of the findings also can be found in the um, uh, spondyloarthritis. So it is something which is really important to mention. Different um, grading systems has been put, but this is the most important and most widely used um, uh, um, grading system for sacroiliitis. It is uh, five grades starting from zero to four. So the zero is normal. Uh, number two is erosion. Number three, erosion and sclerosis. Number four is ankylosis. I keep this one is outside, which is number one. If you think that there is a suspicion of uh, sclerosis or erosion or narrowing, so just label it as um, uh, indefinite or doubtful case. Look for the other case, other findings. So you should just make sure that you are not really missing uh, anything, especially if it is the sacroiliac joint. You see that the uh, bowel loops are just going and uh, masking those joints. So you are really in doubtful uh, stage. So just keep it either zero to one. If you see something definite, just degrade it. CT scan can be helpful uh, as well in the diagnosis of the uh, 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 ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthritis. So this case has erosion, definite, and there is also sclerosis in the iliac aspect, bilateral symmetrical. So this one is stage three or grade three. If there is any fusion of this joint, it will be grade four, and this is ankylosis. Uh, the CT scan can be used as well for the guidance, for the uh, diagnostic and therapeutic um, uh, block. So it's very important to know the uh, 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 rule of CT scan examination and the treatment of the um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis or uh, spondyloarthritis. A case which is really important here to look at, uh, there is a bilateral sclerosis of the uh, sacroiliac joints, more severe on the right side. There is a loss of joint space in the right side, partly here, probably in the left side here. So it's very really important now to say that this is grade three to four because you have a high suspicion of fusion. So it's really important to know that this is sacroiliitis full stop. The sacroiliitis in, 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 in those patients, you might have presentation with uh, any other uh, clinicians and presenting these cases for you. Is it really uh, bilateral osteitis condensus ilii or not? If you see some sort of uh, sclerosis to the other side, you see definite erosions. These are definitive for sacroiliitis. Now, the, um, lots of committees and societies were talking about the uh, sacroiliitis and uh, the ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, the reason why is uh, that uh, the pharmaceutical companies nowadays are pushing more and more for the uh, treatment of these diseases. And um, if you have pharmaceutical uh, com uh, companies dealing with you, you will be very rich. So they spend a lot of money to convince everybody that this should be done. And um, that's why you see lots of societies are sharing for the research in these aspects. So what we really need to, do, uh, to know, we need to know that x-rays are 
very important to start with. And MRI as well is a very important nowadays if you have the ability and you have the surface. Three of these committees or societies, the AMR classification, ESSG, and modified New York classification or grading system, they are definitely using the plain films. What is the end result of the plain film use? If you have bilateral, grade two sacroiliitis, this is definite sacroiliitis. Number two, if you have unilateral, grade three and or four, this is definite sacroiliitis, and they should search for the disease as ankylosing spondylitis slash spondyloarthritis. So it's, this is definitive. The ASS, uh, which is um, uh, this International Society for Ankylosing Spondylitis or Spondyloarthritis, they are using, in addition to the uh, radiographs, they are using the MRI classification. So this is the importance now we should know more about the use of MRI in the diagnosis and confirmation of the spondyloarthritis. I said that HLA positivity is an important issue. If so, if you have a positive HLA B27 and you have a positive MRI, you are highly specified that or specific that you are saying that this is ankylosing spondylitis slash spondyloarthritis. So it's very important two issues. Now, since we are talking about the MRI, um, if you are going to protocol the examination for MRI, examination of the sacroiliitis, we, most of us, we, we, we do coronal, stair coronal, um, uh, uh, T1 weighted axial, T1 axial stair, or T2 fat saturation. But the problem here, we don't teach the technologist how they perform it. So if you say that it is coronal T1 weighted or coronal stair, they will do the true coronal of the body. So they don't do the oblique projection for the SI joint. So this one is not anymore accepted. So if you want to have the whole of the uh, sacroiliac joint present, uh, presented to you in one or three or four uh, 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 images. So the, the most important one is that you do the, your scanning along the, sacra, the sacrum and go for the superior aspect more towards than, than you are going to the sacrococcygeal junction. Because if you go down, this one, there is no joint space. So the most important one is the iliac and sacral relation. So do coronal oblique and then uh, uh, comment on those. This is the type of examination we love to see and to comment. So you see now that the whole joint from superior to inferior, you see them in three or four consecutive images, and you can judge about a single uh, uh, changes. So it is very important. This is the coronal T1, which is coronal oblique, what I meant, and this is the axial stair images. So from this patient, we will just um, find if there is any abnormality. So just concentrate on this point. I will discuss it in another slide. So now, if we do MRI, um, Dr. Asif Sefuddin just now, he was, spoke about the inflammatory stage of modic classification type 1, which is really important in here. If you see edema, that means it's a fluid. Stair is a fluid-sensitive sequence. It will be bright signal intensity. The fluid on T1 weighted will be low signal intensity. So if you see any changes, which is really high signal intensity on a stair, low signal intensity on T1, this is an acute inflammatory stage. So this is the stage which we need to diagnose the patients in. We don't want to go through the stage three or stage two because the disease is already there. And the changes, once they happened in the bone itself, it will be irreversible, especially erosions. Erosions happened, there is no treatment for erosions. The, uh, sta the chronic stage is that Stage three of MODIC, which is low and low, which is sclerosis, low signal intensity on T1, 2, T2, and the stair images. So that is the burnt out case. What we really need to do now, that concentrate on T1 weighted image for the structural damage. So if you need to acute phase, go for the stair images. If you want to comment on the chronic stage, uh, structural events, 
you go for the anatomical sequence, which is the T1 weighted image. So it's the most important issue here for the acute early stages, inflammatory stage is the stair image. And if you are going towards the chronic stage, go for the T1 weighted image. So bone edema, fluid, bright T1, uh, bright uh, stair, bright T2, and low T1. Uh, so stair is the most sensitive one in the acute phase. This is a case here, male uh, patient of uh, 18 years of age complaining of low back pain. And this patient had MRI, uh, the uh, plain X-ray first. So what you really see from the plain X-ray, take the left side. The left side, the joint space is very un unique, very um, uniform. There is no much of irregularity or sclerosis. If you compare this one towards the right side, there is more sclerotic changes in the iliac aspect of this joint, and the joint is wider if you compare this side to the same area to the left side. So this one is abnormal compared to the left side. So the right side, we want to now to confirm our diagnosis. So we have unilateral sclerosis. That means it is grade 2. It's, there is no significant uh, erosion here. So there is sclerosis. Now we go to coronal stair image. This is not really uh, a good coronal oblique. That's why you don't see the whole length of the side joint. But with this, we can tell some, some of the points. The left side is very uni uh, unique and it is uniform. It's not really widened. And you can see the subchondral sclerotic changes that are very neat. And there is no evidence of thickening. There is no evidence of joint effusion. If you compare this to the right side, which is the pathological one, the joint space is widened compared to this one. There is minimal fluid, and th there is no fluid here. And the other point is that you see the subchondral low signal intensity. That means there is sclerosis matching the finding of the uh, plain film, and you see this much of edema. So this, one, this case has uh, a reactive bone changes uh, presented as subchondral cystic change, uh, sclerotic change, as well as the edematous change. So this one is an early subacute or subchronic uh, cases. The other point, the other patient is uh, to the other side. So this one is low signal intensity on uh, T1 weighted, bright signal intensity on T uh, on the T2 fat set or stair images, and you can see them uh, as well in the plane. They are very normal. There is no abnormality detected at all. What we say here is that there is a focus of bright signal intensity on stair. That means it is an edematous change, which was low signal intensity on T1. How can I explain that this one is arthritis? So there is no much joint space in here. So what is the explanation for this? Is the attachment of the tendon or ligament. So this is enthesitis. So this case is enthesitis case. And if you know the normal anatomy of the pelvic region or sacroiliac joint, you see that this is the site of attachment of the sacrospinous ligament. So this is the sacrospinous ligament. This site is the sacrotuberous ligament. So this is an important issue. If you know anatomy, you can explain some of these changes. So this is, case, this is a case of enthesitis. Another uh, the case, which is also the posterior aspect of the SI joint showing an edema, and also edema around the ligaments. So these are the cases of enthesitis. This is an indicator of spondyloarthritis. So the chronic cases, we go for the T1 weighted, and you look for the anatomical changes, structural changes. So this, these are the most important one in the chronic burnt out cases. This is a case showing erosions. The erosion definition that you see a very well-defined bunched out lesion with the sclerotic margin, and it might be associated with minimal of the uh, uh, edematous changes. So this is, these are the erosions here. So you need to m go more, is there any associated edema or no edema? You go for the uh, cases of the um, uh, stair imaging. This is a case which is really interesting. The superior uh, row is T1-weighted coronal oblique. The inferior row is coronal oblique stair images. If you see these, um, the empty arrows, these are low signal intensity in the iliac aspect of the SI joint in the right side. This one is bright signal intensity on T1 weighted, 
in both sides at the sacral aspect. So this is the site where Dr. Um, uh, Asif was mentioning that this is a stage two or t uh, type two of modic classification. This is a fat degeneration. So you see now this one, we should compare the same region on stair. This is low, this is pride 21, slow, low in stair, pride 21. This is definitely a fat component. So we are confident here that everything here is a chronic nature. There is no evidence of edema at all. So this is a chronic um, uh, case of the sacroiliitis. The, this patient is a female 35 years of age, bilateral abnormalities on T1 weighted, that means structural abnormality. But is this one as a, a chronic case or does it have associated acute on top of chronic changes? And that's why we need to do the stair images. If you go here, that this is burned out sclerotic, more than five millimeters thickness, subchondral bone sclerosis. But if you go this way, this one, and you see this one, this is low signal intensity, but not as the same degree of a bone. So this one is low signal. It came to be bright signal. This is edema. So this is acute on top of chronic case, and this is an active disease. So this is not a burnt out uh, disease. The use of gadolinium is really sometimes helpful in, in um, some of the cases, especially if you are thinking about enthesitis inflammatory response. So you just, you can inject the contrast in these cases. Uh, this is um, a conclusion of what the rheumatological people are, are um, believing in, and we should go with them as a matter of fact. If you have a patient who has low back pain, more than three months, and this patient's age or the pain onset began before the age of 45. So three months of low back pain, age less than 45 years of age. If he has sacroiliitis on imaging, plus one of these spondyloarthritis features, he has spondyloarthritis, full stop. If you don't have any imaging techniques, and this patient is HLA B27 positive, plus two features of spondyloarthritis, this is positive for spondyloarthritis. As we said, the radiological manifestation, either plain films, grade two bilateral, or grade three unilateral, or a positive sacroiliitis features on MRI, these are definitive for sacroiliitis. To finish up on the uh, five or six slides, uh, slides about the spinal uh, involvement of the uh, spondyloarthritis. It's, it's very important to know those facts. The disease starts with the SI joint. That's why this is the spondyloarthritis. If there is no uh, sacroiliitis involvement or uh, sacroiliac joints involvement, this is undifferentiated type of spondyloarthritis, definitely with other parameters. This patient has positive bilateral sacroiliitis. No question about this. There is no evidence of changes in the uh, uh, spine, neither thoracic, nor lumbar, or the spinal, uh, the uh, cervical. So this one is free from the spine point of view and positive from the SI joint point of view. You need to do the three areas, which is the uh, cervical, dorsal, and lumbosacral region, which is the whole spine technique. You do them in the sagittal, and axial and the stair and T1 weighted images. You should look at the corners, especially if you are searching about spondyloarthritis. The spondyloarthritis starts as enthesitis at the site of attachment of the capsule or the sharpest ligament. So these areas are the most pronounced areas to be affected. So start searching for these changes in here. The anterior component of the spine can be involved. The posterior element can be involved. So you search for the anterior uh, 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 margins of the vertebral bodies as well as the posterior element of the vertebral bodies, which is the, uh, what I mean that for the uh, spinal column, which are the, uh, uh, the facetal joints. So it's very important to have um, uh, a clear vision about the sacroiliac uh, joint and the spinal involvement. So this case has uh, facetal joint arthritis involvement in the uh, dorsolumbar spine. Uh, 
This patient has the cervicodorsal junction and the costovertebral junction uh, uh, arthritis. So this is a, a thing which is really positive. So these are involvement of the spinal uh, uh, cord or the spinal um, uh, column. This is a posterior element involvement, especially you might have patients complaining of uh, 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 Baastrab's disease like picture, which is the uh, pain if they just uh, hyperextend their back and there will be a reactive um, a reaction in the interspinous joint. So that is the area which we should uh, search for. But if you see an element of enthesitis at the site of insertion of the interspinous ligament, this is the area which is really important for you to diagnose spondyloarthritis. This patient has both, has the anterior element and the posterior element's involvement, and you can see them there. So this is a spinal involvement in a case of the uh, um, uh, 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 spondyloarthritis. You can see even in the higher up uh, uh, dorsal spine uh, involvement. So now we, we go to the conclusion of what we said before. Previously, we, we have been taught and we learned a lot. We read the textbooks that saying that spondylarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, is very common in Caucasians. It's very rare in Middle East population. Nowadays, it's not true, not any more true. What we should do that, we should know that it is common, it is undermined, and nowadays, we should be very cautious in those cases, complaining of low back pain, and we should go for further evaluation to exclude involvement of the spondyloarthritis. MRI, I said that it is very important to discuss the cases of acute or chronic or the mixture, which is acute on top of chronic changes. So these are the important issues. We should not... Uh, uh, omit the importance of clinical data, CRP, HLAP 27 positivity, so we should have close relation with the clinicians. Uh, and MRI is an important issue to do nowadays before giving the patient biological agents. So it's very important to do a baseline examination and then do the follow-up. Thank you very much. for this nice uh, presentation. And uh, if anyone has a question for Dr. Ismail or Dr. Asif for his uh, previous presentation. Um, thank you very much for the speaker. Uh, question just for Dr. Asif. Huh? I'm Dr. Nami. Um, Dr. Asif, um, when do we treat those lesions which are in the spine, like um, the disc, the protrusion? Um, do we treat it because of symptoms, or do we treat it when size-wise? Uh, how far can we go in treatment, which I mean by injection or uh, nerve root blocks and so on? Because we are faced with a lot of those cases on and off, and um, those patients really don't get managed by other colleagues, and uh, we end up with a lot of those cases, and we don't know how far we can go. Yeah, I mean, are we talking about the disc protrusions, which, uh, which are compressing nerve risk? Well, obviously, I think um, we would not use injections for protrusions with purely back pain. We commonly use nerve root blocks for injections with soft discs, um, hopefully to obviously relieve symptoms and potentially to save the patient from surgery if we can repeat the injection a couple of times and the disc resolves. Um, and I think our experience is similar to yours. I think it's, uh, we sent these patients because nobody else wants to deal with them, uh, you know, by chronic pain management, by spinal surgeons. Uh, and I think the real outcome is very, very variable. We've had some cases I can remember that has been responsible up to nine months, but it's unusual. And I think mostly, um, um, I mean, my, I, I'm not doing these currently myself commonly. Maybe my colleague Sajid can, um, he's doing these much more commonly.
pass the microphone to Dr. Sajid, please, and he can maybe um, give his current experience on, on these injections. He's just sitting in the audience there. Thank you. I think uh, there are two parts to the question. One is to try and deal with the low back pain and to come to the conclusion whether the posterior analyteas are uh, responsible for those symptoms or not. And if you see them, um, can you do anything about it? Uh, like Asif said in his talk that in a lot of um, asymptomatic volunteers, we see signs of uh, degenerative disc disease and they're not necessarily symptomatic. And the same goes true with the posterior analyteas as well. It has been well reported that in a significant number of asymptomatic patients, you will see them. So when you do see them in a symptomatic person, whether that is in what is causing them the problem or it is just the biochemical abnormality of the disc which is resulting in irritation of the nociceptor, which is causing pain, I don't know. So we do not just treat the analytheor itself. I know there are uh, people in this room who would uh, do RF ablations or uh, one of my other colleagues does uh, laser ablation for analytheors. But uh, in my experience, the symptomatic relief is short-lived. When it comes to um, treatment of sciatica with image-guided injections of steroids, it does buy you time in a significant number of patients. Uh, if they are young and there are no other uh, problems in their spinal alignment and disc morphology, it may be curative. But usually, more often than not, it is only used as a diagnostic arm to confirm that their leg pain is resulting from this level and they would ultimately need surgery. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Khalid for his uh, updated lecture, but I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask about, there is a common clear uh, etiologies for uh, this spondyloarthritis diseases. And the uh, second question, uh, can we simply uh, classify or stage Mundilo arthritis disease according to the joint space narrowing or widening? Uh, the first question is about uh, clinical manifestation of spondylo arthritis, you mean? Or, uh, there is a common clear etiologies. Like? Autoimmune or traumatic or. Uh, Most common etiologies. The, the, the spondylar arthritis, as, as we said, that it is a, a family of or group of diseases which can cause the uh, arthritis in the spine and also the joints. So two uh, issues here. So spine, SI joints, and the peripheral joints are affected here. Um, so the etiology, uh, lots of, of, of things we, we can say that it is. Could it be related to uh, inflammatory bowel disease? Could it be related to psoriatic arthritis? Could it be related to uh, 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 idiopathic uh, AV block disease, etc., etc. So things uh, should be gathered, all of them, and then you can reach through the diagnosis of, of uh, is it ankylosing spondylitis? Is it uh, uh, juvenile spondylar arthritis? Is it a sort of uh, psoriatic or writer's disease? So these are the group of spondylar arthritis. The second question was about uh, can we simply stage or classify okay. according to the okay. joint space? Okay, uh, the um, uh, scoring systems, we, 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 uh, I already mentioned that if you want to um, report a case of joint uh, disease, like hands, feet, uh, knees, you should uh, have a systematic approach, number one. Number two. Every uh, disease has its own classification. For instance, if you have osteoarthritis of the knees, kellgren lorenz classification is a known way of classification or grading the disease. So uh, what type of disease you are uh, going with or, or you, ha you are having, you have its own classification or staging system. And in cases of spondylar arthritis, uh, lots of, of uh, literature has been written about the grading or the, uh, grading the severity of the disease. The most important two uh, indicators for the severity of the disease is the joint space uh, narrowing or changes and the erosion. So these are the two issues which are really important in, in the spondyloarthritis. Uh, 
I'm a chest radiologist, so I'm going to dare asking a question about the neuro and the uh, MRI of the lumbar spine, which I don't know anything. But I've been dealing recently about appropriateness of imaging. And it seems like um, overusing MRI for the lumbar spine for chronic back pain is the poster chart of poor usage of imaging, meaning by the fact that really all the billions of dollars that we spend every year on evaluating low back pain, chronic low back pain, it doesn't really affect ultimately management and especially outcome. So I don't know if this is something that is being addressed. And obviously when there is an exact cause for which we can manage, that's fine. But again, as far as a public health issue, you know, what, what you take about, um, you know, either from England or here, what you take about the overutilization of MRI for the evaluation of chronic low back pain? I think the, for us it's maybe a bit of a difficult question to answer because we are tertiary referral centre, so we commonly see these patients who have gone through many years of undiagnosis in, from either general practice or the, the uh, district hospitals uh, and may have had multiple surgeries. So we have a very, very biased patient population. Uh, I mean, it's almost impossible, I think, for a patient to come to our hospital without having had an MR or, or having an MR. Um, but I would agree on one point is that the, the ability to make a clinical diagnosis now I think seems to be almost disappearing from our clinicians and quite often you look in the notes and they'll say uh, low back pain, get an MRI and then they'll see the patient again. And I think this is very, very unfortunate because you know, without the correlation with a clinic, kind of careful clinical examination then the patient is heading for you know, potentially a dangerous um, you know, route in terms of unnecessary surgery. I think it's undoubtedly the case. Um, but again, I think the other situation we're maybe finding ourselves in, which is something which I think we spoke about a bit yesterday, is the defensive medical situation and wanting to miss anything, um, which leads us to image possibly unnecessarily in the cases of chronic back pain. I don't know if that's answered the question really, but uh, it is a problem, I think. And I think that uh, we should have also some sort of uh, uh, another issue. Uh, because of the uh, development and, and the uh, clinical uh, radiopharmaceutical aspect of the diseases nowadays, um, I think that um, we should go for some sort of uh, bias with the clinician as well because we found a couple of cases was uh, as mentioned, that this chronic lower back pain for a long time, uh, they use uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication and they have no response. These are one of the areas which is really important. If you have a good clinician and he can differentiate between the mechanical type of uh, back pain and the inflammatory type of back pain, and he has a strong evidence of that this one is an um, uh, inflammatory type of back pain, we should go with that one and we image him. But if this mechanical type of back pain, like degenerative disease, uh, that one would, we might stop at the limit of the uh, plain x-ray. So I think nowadays if, if we know that uh, in depth clinical uh, knowledge that we should differentiate between inflammatory and mechanical pain, low back pain, we should go with them uh, and, and this issue. The second point is, um, it is I think it is worth uh, a few uh, describe a case uh, out of 50 cases that it is an early manifestation of uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, I, I think this is a good achievement to, to, to start the medication in those patients as early as possible. Because you know that uh, the complications of those diseases are uh, disabling. And if you have a patient which is less than 45 years of age uh, and diagnosed for 10 years, that means he's uh, about 55 years and he's already retired or he cannot do anything. I think that, that we should be also on the same, the same side of the patient care. Uh, if we have a patient with inflammatory type of pain, undiagnosed, and referred to a third or uh, a tertiary or secondary institution for this cause. Uh, so I, I think that we should be careful in, in, in 
refusing those cases uh, uh, as for no much reason that it is costly or uh, it takes lots of lots of time taking the location of a patient uh, who is really in more demand when compared to those cases i think that we should be in the middle and uh, support the patient care more than just refusing without any reasoning okay we uh, I just want to follow up and then we have to go i guess for uh, for salat the door but i just want to my question was leading to the fact that us as a radiologist and then with the clinicians, we have to come up with stricter guidelines and when to use appropriately imaging, especially expensive imaging such as MRI. Because at least in the US, it's gonna be forced upon us that the insurance companies and the reimbursement is gonna actually determine exactly how we're gonna practice. And I think that we should play a proactive role about doing that. The other thing is that there is pressure from the patient's population, not just defensive medicine, that you have to give an expensive uh, imaging study such as MRI, otherwise you're not considered as a good physician. So I think that notion has to be also dispelled. Okay, so by... Uh, I have just one comment. Yeah, sure. In, in Medina, do we have uh, sickle cell disease here? Is it common? Okay. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm asking about this one, because uh, the lecture of uh, uh, Prof. Asif is uh, about the uh, infection osteomyelitis. Uh, if, if you agree, uh, Asif, about the, those cases of uh, sickle cell disease, they will have an acute uh, uh, sickle cell disease crisis. And if most of the time they are sp sent for MRI examination to exclude osteomyelitis cases. And frequently we see subperiosteal fluid collection in those cases. And in pediatric age group, we do ultrasound that we find elevation of the periosteum with the fluid collection. Uh, my experience and from the literature reviews do not aspirate as those lesions. I I'm asking just uh, for this. It is uh, non-infected, it is reactive fluid collection, there is no uh, uh, osteomyelitis for these patients. So uh, do you agree also for these cases? Uh, well, so I cannot comment. We, we do not see sickle cell in our hospital. I mean, it's probably it's very, very common in London, but it's not part of our specialist uh, referral pattern. So it, is, it is a conundrum, really. I mean, yes. to see, if you see the fluid collection, it's enhancing, and the patient has white cell count in ESR, and it's difficult not to call it osteomyelitis, but uh, I, I've read this uh, and uh, had this similar experience before. You know, Zahid, about sickle cell? Yeah, well, would, uh, only thing we left with in this uh, uh, dilemma is, is the peristeal elevation and the FCL involvement. Mm -hmm. Now, if you strip that off, then we'll just stop at the <laughs> <laughs> imaging and we say we don't know. <laughs> okay, I think we conclude now. We'll take a break for Salah and uh, lunch and uh, two o'clock. Back at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>